It's been a while since we dived into something exciting with shaders and today is the day. In this video, I'm going to walk you through how I built this Lava Buster animation using 3JS and some incredible shaders I found on Shader Toy. As you can see, the animation reacts to mouse movement, creating these fiery particle effects that give off a really cool vibe. Now, I'm not a shader expert, but when I saw this kind of animation, I had to figure out how to incorporate it into a website. Shader Toy, by the way, is an amazing platform where graphics programmers share their shader-based visual effects. It's a great resource if you want to explore more of these. We'll take some of that shader code and use 3JS to bring this animation to life on a web page. Here is a quick preview of the shaders we are working with and I'll make sure to drop a link to them in the description. Before we dive in, don't forget to like this video and if you haven't yet, consider subscribing for more content like this. If you are interested in the source code, you can access it through the pro membership. The link is in the description. Alright, let's jump into the code. Let's start with the HTML. Honestly, we don't need anything here, but I have added a basic navigation bar and a footer just to have some placeholder content. Before we move on, just make sure you include the 3JS CDN to load everything we need for the animation. That's all we need for the HTML side. Let's also add some basic styling to make the navbar and footer look a bit more polished. We'll set up some basic global styles. First, we'll remove all the default margins and padding from elements and ensure everything uses border box sizing. For the body, we'll make it full screen, set up a clean, modern font and hide any overflow to keep the viewport tidy. Now we'll position the navbar at the top and the footer at the bottom, both spanning the full width. Flexbox helps us space the content out and we'll use a Z index to ensure they are on top of everything else. The text is styled in uppercase and white to keep things simple. with a slight opacity on the navbar text for a subtle effect. At this point, you won't see anything on the page just yet. That's because we haven't added the canvas, which will have a black background and handle all the animations. We'll get to that next when we dive into the JavaScript setup. Before we jump into writing any 3JS code, we need to add the shaders that power this effect. I'm going to create a folder called shaders and add three files. Now, the original project on the shader toy had four buffers plus the final image shader, but for our 3JS setup, we only need three of these buffers. Buffers C and D were used for additional calculations that enhance the visual effect, but for our adaptation, we can simplify things and achieve a similar result without them. So I'll paste those three shaders into the project. Let's break them down. Buffer A is the main driver of the effect. It handles all the particle tracking and updates. You can think of it as the choreographer of our lava particles, telling them how to move. Buffer B handles the physics of the lava. It calculates the density and velocity of the fluid, determining how thick and fast the lava should flow at any given point. Finally, we have the image shader, which is like the artist of the operation. It takes all the calculations from buffers A and B and transform them into glowing fiery lava effect you see on the screen. Now, like I have mentioned before, I am not an expert at writing shaders myself, but I did some research using Claude to get a better understanding of what each of these shaders does. With the shaders in place, we are ready to start writing our JavaScript code. Alright, we'll start by setting up some core components, the renderer, camera, and the final quad that display the animation on the screen. We are also going to initialize four buffers, A, B, C, and D, plus an image buffer to handle the final output of our shaders. And to track mouse movement, we'll use a vector 4 which allows us to store both the position and whether the mouse is clicked or not. We'll also keep track of the frame count to ensure the animation runs smoothly over time. Next, we define a constant called resolution scale and set it to 2. This is used to scale up the resolution of our animation, giving us a crisper and higher quality output. By doubling the resolution, we ensure that the details in the animation are sharper and not pixelated when displayed on high resolution screens. Then we declare three variables, buffer A shader, buffer B shader, and image shader. These are placeholders for the shader code we'll be loading. Each of these shaders is crucial for creating the final visual effect and we'll assign them as soon as we fetch the shader files. Now comes the part where we load the actual shader code. 
will use promise which allows us to fetch multiple files at once and wait for all of them to finish loading before we move on. We are fetching three shader files we just created. Each of these fetch requests returns a promise and once all the promise is resolved, we get access to the shader code as text. We then assign each shader's code to its corresponding variable and once all the shaders are loaded, we move on to the next step which is initializing 3.js environment by calling the init function. This is where we'll set up the renderer, the camera and the scene. We'll also call animate function to kick off the animation loop that continuously renders the lava effect. Now that we have loaded the shaders, let's move on to setting up the environment where our animation will be rendered. This happens inside the init function. First, we'll initialize the WebGL renderer using 3.WebGL renderer. WebGL is the technology that allows us to render high performance 3D graphics in the browser and in this case, we are using it for our 2D animation. I have enabled anti-aliasing which smooths out the edges of our visuals making the final output look cleaner. Next, we set the size of the renderer to match the full width and height of the browser window, ensuring the animation covers the entire screen. We also set the pixel ratio to match the device's pixel density, which is important for high DPI screens to make sure the animation looks sharp. After that, we attach the renderer to the document, effectively adding the canvas element to our web page so the animation has somewhere to display. Now we need a camera. We are using an orthographic camera here which is great for 2D rendering because it doesn't introduce any perspective distortion. In simple terms, objects that are farther away won't appear smaller, which is exactly what we want for this type of effect. Next, we define the resolution of the animation. We are using a vector tool to store the width and height of the window scaled by resolution scale constant. This will give us more pixels to work with, leading to a smoother, higher quality animation. Now we set up the buffers. Each of these buffers represents a different stage of the shader process. Buffer A is created first and this is where all the particle tracking and movement calculations will happen. Then we have buffer B, C and D which handle additional processing like fluid dynamics and other visual effects. Finally, we create the image buffer which will combine everything from the other buffers and render the final visual effect. Next, we set up the scene for the final render. We create a material using 3js.shadermaterial and this is where we tell 3js to use the textures from our shaders to render the final output. The vertex shader is responsible for calculating the position of each vertex and the fragment shader controls the color of each pixel. To display the result, we create a simple plane geometry that spans the entire screen. This plane acts as a canvas where our final animation will be drawn. Now we want to make the animation interactive so we add event listeners for mouse movements and clicks. We track the mouse position using a vector 4 which allows us to capture the x and y coordinates along with whether the mouse is pressed down or not. This will allow us to influence the animation based on the mouse input. Lastly, we add a resize event listener to ensure the animation adapts if the window size changes. This keeps everything responsive and ensures the animation fits any screen size. That's it for the initialization. We have now set up the renderer, the camera, the buffers and added interactivity with mouse events. Now let's talk about how we create the buffers that will handle the rendering of our shader animation. First, we have the create double buffer function. The idea behind a double buffer is that it allows us to swap between two buffers, a read buffer and a write buffer on each frame of the animation. This is crucial because each frame depends on the previous one and double buffering makes sure the process runs smoothly. Here is how it works. We create two buffers using the create buffer function. One buffer is used for reading and the other is used for writing. Then after each frame, we swap the read and write buffer so that the next frame can use the output of the previous one. This is all done in the swap method. Next, let's look at the create buffer function. This is where we set up each individual buffer. 
we start by creating a new 3GS scene. Each buffer has its own scene because we'll be rendering different parts of the effect in each one. Then we create a WebGL render target which is like an off-screen canvas where we can render our effects before displaying them on the main canvas. We specify the size of the buffer based on the resolution of the screen and we use linear filter for both the min and mag filters to ensure the texture is smooth. The render target also uses RGBA format to store color and alpha information and float type which allows us to store more detailed information in each pixel. This is important for the precision of the particle movements and fluid simulations. Next, we set up the shader material. This material is the core of our rendering process because it defines how the shader interacts with the scene. We pass in several important uniforms which are dynamic variables the shader uses during each frame. I channel 0, I channel 1 and I channel 2 will store textures that the shader can use to generate the effect. I resolution tells the shader the size of the canvas so it knows how to calculate pixel positions. I mouse tracks the mouse position so we can make the animation interactive. I time is used to keep track of how much time has passed making the animation continuous. I frame tracks the number of frames that have passed so we can control the animation's flow frame by frame. Then we create a plane geometry, a simple 2D rectangle that spans the entire screen. This geometry will be rendered using the shader material we just created. We add the plane to the buffer scene and that's it. Each buffer is now ready to handle a specific part of the shader calculations. In summary, create double buffer gives us two buffers to switch between, while create buffer sets up each individual buffer with a scene, a target for off-screen rendering and the shader material that drives the animation. Now let's walk through the functions that handle user interaction and window resizing. First, we have the on mouse move function. This function is triggered every time the mouse moves across the screen. What it does is update the mouse position variable with the current x and y coordinates of the mouse. We multiply mouse's position by the resolution scale to ensure that it matches the resolution of our animation. The scaling is necessary because our animation is rendered at a higher resolution to maintain a crisp and clearer look. The x coordinate is straightforward. It's just the mouse's horizontal position. For the y coordinate, we take the window height minus the mouse's vertical position position so we correctly track the movement relative to the bottom left corner which is where the webgl coordinates start from next we have the on window resize function which ensures that the animation adjusts dynamically when the browser window is resized this is important because we don't want the animation to stretch or distort when the user resizes the window First, we calculate the new width and height of the window again factoring in our resolution scale to keep the animation sharp We then store these dimensions in a vector2 object so that we can pass them to our buffers and shader uniforms. We also update the size of the WebGL renderer to match the new window dimensions. This ensures that the canvas always covers the full screen. Inside the on window resize function, we define a helper function called resize double buffer. This function takes a buffer as input and updates both the read and write targets to match the new dimensions of the window. It also updates the resolution uniform inside each shader material so the shader knows how to properly render at the new resolution. We call resize double buffer on each of four buffers to update them accordingly. We also do the same for image buffer which handles the final rendering for the animation. This way, every element in our scene from the shader buffers to the final output gets resized correctly, keeping everything responsive and visually consistent. In summary, these two functions on mouse move and on window resize are critical for making sure the animation responds to user input and stays flexible across different screen sizes. Now let's dive into the animate function. This is where all the rendering happens frame by frame to create our animated lava effect. First, we call request animation frame. This tells the browser to call the animate function repeatedly ensuring that our animation runs smoothly and efficiently. It essentially creates an endless loop where each iteration corresponds to a new frame of the animation. 
Next, we get the current time using performance dot now function and convert it into seconds by multiplying it by 0 0.001. We also increment the frame counter to keep track of how many frames have passed. These values will be passed into the shaders as uniforms so the animation progresses over time. Now we move on to updating each buffer. Starting with buffer A, we set its uniforms passing in the textures from the previous frame using i channel 0 and i channel 1. i channel 0 gets the texture from the read target of buffer A and i channel 1 gets the texture from buffer B. We also update time to control the animation's time progression and frame to keep track of the frame count. After seeing these uniforms, we render the scene for buffer A but we don't display it on the screen yet. Instead, we render it off screen into the right target of buffer A. Next, we do the same for buffer B. We use the output from buffer A as input for buffer B and then render its scene into the right target of buffer B. This allows us to process the lava's fluid dynamics and particle interaction in stages. We repeat this process for buffer C and D, both of which also take the output from buffer A and their own textures as inputs. These buffers add extra visual effects like enhancing the detail of fluidity of the animation. Once all the buffers have been processed, we move on to the image buffer. This buffer takes the texture from buffer A, buffer B and buffer C as inputs. These textures contain all the calculations from the previous buffers and image buffer combines them to create the final lava effect. Again, we render this off screen. Finally, we display the output. We set the render target to null, which means we are now rendering to the screen. The final quad uses the texture from image buffer to display the glowing lava effect on the canvas. After rendering the frame, we swap the read and write buffers for buffer A, B, C and D. This ensures that the next frame can use the output of the current frame as input, creating a continuous dynamic animation. In summary, the animate function updates the shaders, processes the buffers and renders the result on the screen, frame by frame, ensuring the animation flows smoothly and interacts with the mouse movement. And that's it, what I just explained was a high level breakdown of each part of the code, giving you a sense of what's happening behind the scenes. This overview can help you grasp the workflow, but if you are serious about building projects like this from scratch, there is no substitute for mastering the fundamentals. I hope this video gave you a useful starting point. If it did, be sure to hit the like button and if you are interested in more tutorials like this, consider subscribing. Thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you in the next one.